Episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Welcome, everybody, again to another episode of our show, bringing you not one but two really awesome guests today involved in creating a better tomorrow. Uh, we're headed down uh, back uh, to Rice University today uh, with the show and have the honor uh, first being joined uh, by Dr. Omid Vesa who is uh, associate professor in the Department of Bioengineering, uh, Cancer Prevention and Research Institute of Texas Scholar in Cancer Research and director of their new biotech launch pad, uh, where he leads a research program aimed at engineering really next generation treatments for a range of human diseases, levering, te levering techniques like synthetic biology, immunoengineering, material sciences to, uh, to develop these innovative cell-based platforms. Uh, he is additionally a serial entrepreneur uh, has uh, founded numerous companies, including Sigalon Therapeutics, Avenge Bio, Sentinel Bio, and Curata, uh, which companies collectively have attracted uh, over half a billion dollars in both private and public investment. Uh, we're also joined uh, by Dr. Paul Watton, who is the Rice Biotech Launchpad Executive Director. Uh, Dr. Watton got his PhD in pharmaceutical sciences, uh, University of Nottingham, an experienced CEO, board member, inventor, and entrepreneur, uh, extensive experience as well in, in strategic growth management, business transactions, product development, and service on the board of numerous companies, including Vericell, Sonata, uh, Kaida Pen, Combined Therapeutics, and as well as co-founder and director of Avenge Bio. Um, a lot to get into today, a lot of really interesting themes to touch on. Dr. Amid Vesa, uh, Dr. Paul Watton, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show. Yeah, nice to meet you. Thank you for having us. Great having both of you. Um, really excited about these topics. Um, I, you know, I'd love to start off. Um, I, I think you know we'll we'll, we'll go to Amit first. I, I mean, I, 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 um, you know, I, as people who watch the show know, I like taking a look at our our uh, sort of a guest scientific history. You know, you're a theme that's quite common um, throughout your publications is sort of this marrying of really unique uh, bioproducts with really unique biomaterials. And you know, took a look at your <laughs> Your PhD from 2009, the development of multifunctional nanoparticles for brain tumor diagnosis and therapy. Uh, here, you're not just merged really interesting biomaterials, but a really cool uh, scorpion toxin. We just did a show on venoms last week and, and the pharmaceutical applications. Take us back to 2009 and, and introduce us to a, a little bit of how you got interested in this uh, in this therapeutic space. Oh, into um, like biotechnology as a whole? Or... Yep. 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 So, um, you know, I think uh, when, um, yeah, I, I started my, uh, I graduated from my PhD and really interested in thinking about therapeutics and uh, saw a talk by Bob Langer, who um, was really, uh, you know, fantastic as a scientist, but also as a en prolific entrepreneur. Yeah. And, um, you know, I guess he's, he's called the Edison of medicine. And I thought it was really fascinating how you could take a market-driven approach to scientific discovery, where you're really thinking about unique unmet medical needs and opening yourself up to the possibility of a number of potential modalities that could be impactful for those indications. And uh, really designing uh, difficult experiments using the best models that are available as your gold standard and working hard to screen as many combinations and find the best solution for that problem. And uh, and that was my postdoc experience, which was um, quite exciting. I was able to, um, you know, uh, 
think about a, a, a specific problem really deeply, which has broad implications. And that was, you know, there's a lot of potential applications of medical devices in the body, but most of them are hindered based on the body recognizing the material as foreign and creating a foreign body response. And that uh, in itself uh, has served as a barrier to a lot of additional innovations in that space. So we were really focused on this question, what if we could create a material that the body didn't recognize as foreign mm -hmm. and um, explore the diversity of potential solutions. We developed high throughput phenotypic screening approaches to really screen and identify lead materials that are able to do that. And I thought that was like a really exciting um, sort of uh, prospect to scientific innovation and being able to solve that problem, recognize mm -hmm. that that could open up a lot of different solutions and many products could be generated from it. So uh, platforms are exciting, you know, thinking about um, really cutting edge discoveries like that, that really make a lot of other things possible is, is quite compelling. So um, that's basically how um, I've kind of geared my uh, scientific inquiry and the work that I've done in terms of product development uh, into the, that, that approach. Excellent, really excellent. And, and Paul, you know, I, I took a look at your stuff too from, uh, you know, back at Nottingham and clearly you were on the early on the pharmacokinetics path here, uh, but then, you know, headed straight into, uh, you know, a serial entrepreneurship across the biotech space. Uh, say a few words about yourself as well, because you've had a quite an interesting ride the last couple of decades as well. Yeah, I've had um, an unplanned but very interesting career. And uh, I uh, started out as a scientist, graduated from Nottingham and um, worked for Big Pharma, two of them, Merck and Abbott, great training. And then I was lucky enough to start work for a company called Penn West, uh, which was based in Seattle. It was a conglomerate and uh, was brought across the US where I stayed in 1992 um, to put together a business out of a technology they had in one of the labs in one of their divisions. And we actually um, floated that on NASDAQ in 1998. But I was the person responsible for identifying how you can take a platform, turn it into a licensing opportunity for pharma partners, as well as what products would we develop on our own to get to the FDA and have an early visible success? And uh, that company did a number of transactions, which I was responsible for. So I did all the business development. But through that, I learned a process on um, actually taking platforms and turning them into companies and how you prioritize what you do as a result of that. And then I went on to join a Warburg Pincus spin out from uh, Wyeth called Urand. Uh, mm -hmm went to that company i worked in milan for a couple of years on and off uh, mainly on so yeah, milan's a great city to be in <laughs> and uh, then i went to work for sky farmers head of business development we did a lot of transactions in two and a half years i was there my first ceo gig was up in canada which was an anti-sense company and from there i moved back down to um new jersey in actual fact where i ran antares and that was a successful six years, took a, a platform company there, transitioned it into a specialty pharma company. And then my career just took off in a very unexpected way. I was headhunted about a company in Marlborough, Massachusetts called Advanced Cell Technology, which was a pioneer in stem cell research in this right. country. And that one was a company that had fantastic science there's no doubt about it. it's world leading science based on embryonic stem cells which is hard to fund at the time right. and um that one i was able to turn around um the main challenge we had was that the balance sheet was terrible but i figured if i fix the balance sheet the science would take care of itself and that's actually what happened we did run out and get a financing and then estellas bought the company so um i worked there with bob langer on the board um, through Bob, I met this guy here mm -hmm. and we started Sigalon together and um, my pretty much most of my career since 2014, which is a decade now, has been spent on these uh, advanced therapeutic products, uh, cell and gene therapies. And I, I feel I've landed in a really good place. And today in Houston, which is where I'm working with Amid on the uh, biotech launchpad initiative, 
we're actually talking to you from the Texas Medical Center Helix Park facility, which is a world-class uh, $5.6 billion development right in the middle of the Texas Medical Center to accelerate medical discoveries into the clinic, which uh, the Rice Biotech Launchpad uh, is all part of. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It, it, let's let's go there now because um you know as you were just mentioning this is not your guys first dance together um at the launch pad you know uh you, you together with avenge bio sigalon now now part of lily so had uh good collaborations between you two and some major successes um take us down to houston i mean i'm i'm sitting here in you know the east coast uh, in philadelphia we're having our own little sort of biotech renaissance here and and trying to sort of mimic a little bit of what you're doing down there, but talk just a little bit, introduce us to sort of uh, the uh, Houston ecosystem for all things bioscience, bioengineering, and a little bit about ultimately how after uh, playing around and in a few of these really successful companies together, uh, you came up uh, to get together for the Rice Biotech Launchpad. Can I can I suggest we follow a, a schedule here, sure. um, which would be for... Amid was the first guy to come down to Houston to work at Rice. So I'd like to sort of suggest we start off with his perspective. Sure. And then what will happen is I'll be able to take you through when I started coming down here regularly as part of my responsibilities with another company. And then part three will be why the hell are we doing this now together? Excellent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I think what attracted me initially to come to Houston and Rice was, you know, I think for, for decades there's been a long history of, clinicians working closely with engineers at Rice, dating back to uh, the work of uh, Bill Akers and uh, DeBakey, who worked together to build the artificial heart. I mean, DeBakey uh, was able to accomplish that goal by tapping into the uh, bioengineers. I mean, at the time, bioengineering as a field didn't really exist. It was in chemical engineering and electrical engineering. But those engineers were thinking about if we were going to do this, what type of materials do we need? How do we test mm -hmm. it? How do we model it? And um, that kind of spirit and culture exists in this city. Uh, we have the largest medical center in the world. We have, uh, I think it's 60 different hospital institutions all in one campus, which is the Texas Medical Center campus. And uh, about 10 million patients a year get uh, treated here. And many clinical trials, you know, in oncology, it's, it's something like 70% of all clinical trials happen here in, in Houston. And so what I thought was a fascinating opportunity was, uh, you know, in, in as scientists and engineers, we always need more data. Mm -hmm. And the data that I myself could generate in the lab would largely be animal data. And it's very uh, unlikely, unfortunately, is the case where the animal data doesn't translate very well to the humans. And so I think what we need to do in terms of um, people like myself who are bioengineers trying to develop solutions for human health is to really try to uh, access as much of the human data as possible. And we see and hear about the products that are successful in the clinical trial, and that's helpful in generating some of the insights. But there's a large, lot of insights that the unsuccessful trials can also provide us. But that information is largely not in the public domain. And the only way you access it is by working closely with a clinician who maybe worked on the trial, saw firsthand how well it was working. Perhaps it wasn't good enough to reach statistical significance, but they know the ins and outs and they know the shortcomings. And as a technologist, that type of information is quite attractive to me because then I can start thinking about, well, what type of technology should I build to get that idea across the finish line? In many cases, there are drug delivery problems. In some cases, mm -hmm. there are um, multiplex biologics problems, uh, you know, getting access through certain parts of the, uh, of the body, like maybe getting into the brain with bioelectronic devices, spatial and temporal regulation over production. These are fundamental um, tools we have where if you apply them to specific problems where you know, hey, if I just reach, if I just achieve, if I build a widget that can do X, Y, and Z, then this is actually going to have a profound impact in medicine because there's already been 
some early feasibility work done based on another trial. And I think that's uh, a unique opportunity that exists here that attracted me to Houston in particular. Mm -hmm. Paul? Yes. So I um, was working with Amid when he made the decision to come down here and uh, start up a group in Houston. And you've actually done really well. It's a huge group now. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, we have 30 of, researchers. We've got 30 researchers. And the opportunity for me that um, I worked with specifically was when I was running Obsidian. And uh, we went through a process there at the company where we identified uh, in my first 90 days there uh, with a colleague of mine, Kirsten Kester, we identified uh, where we could actually participate with our technology there um, in treating patients with cancer. And we were looking at uh, a variety of cell types to engineer. One was NK cells, one were CAR Ts, and the third was actually uh, TILs, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. And we, in July of 2019, decided that we were going to go after TILs at the company. And um, at that time, we actually hadn't worked on TILs within the company, so it was quite a bold decision. Uh, but by the end of 2019, we had, in fact, engineered TILs in the lab, and the IL-15 driven TIL was doing everything we wanted to. It's more active against tumors and actually um, independent of what's known as IL-2, which if you're a patient and you're on IL-2, therapy to support till therapy half of those patients generally end up in the icu being treated <laughs> for the effects of the um the il2 so we identified that opportunity it was market driven but also dovetail with the technology which is the common theme here and um, for me personally we wanted to make that happen sooner rather than later and it was actually at about that time in November 2019, we first came across um, Jason Bock and the group down here at MD Anderson in a manufacturing unit, which they now call CTMC. And we were interested in getting into the clinic fast and being able to get the development process completed quickly as well. And MD Anderson had established a reputation in till therapy. And there was a melanoma expert, uh, Rhoda Ameria, who uh, works at MD Anderson, and uh, she had worked with, closely with Jason. And so in February of 2020, I met with Jason in Cambridge, and we decided we were going to do this transaction where they would develop our TIL therapy. And our goal was to get that into the clinic within four years, basically. And at the time, we thought that was ambitious. And um, we kicked off the project in February 2020. A month later, everybody's working from home. And despite <laughs> that, we didn't miss a beat on the development program because between Obsidian and Jason, we had different skill sets, but we managed a really super alliance. We were able to dose our first patient in um, December of uh, 2021. Mm -hmm. So think about that, right? It's yep. uh, less than That's three and a half years now since we first had the product concept. And the first patient was dosed in December of 2021. And uh, I did my job of getting them into the clinic. And that first patient, I'm delighted to say, was a complete response. So uh, we left with some success. And I understand that product is now uh, doing well also in the clinical trials. So what that taught me about here was that there was a huge opportunity to work with groups like MD Anderson and the infrastructure they have down here to be able to expedite ideas from labs into the clinic mm -hmm. and then i realized when i was talking to amid that there was a similar opportunity here down in houston in fact i talked about that with uh, amid and jason and others and um, i'm down in houston last august and this guy here says to me i've got a meeting with the president of rice tomorrow i want to start an accelerator to do exactly what we we're just talking about getting drugs into the clinic fast yeah. And that's how the biotech launch plan um, was conceived. Um, he went in the day after. Uh, we worked on the presentation the afternoon <laughs> before that. And I saw him the next morning. I said, how did it go? He goes, I just got funded. So <laughs> then it's a question of um, how do you move from there? So what I thought was a pretty smart move was we set a target deadline to have this all announced and done like three weeks later, which was the anniversary, the 63rd anniversary, I think it was, or 61st anniversary of Kennedy doing his moonshot speech in 20, right. 1962. 
And here we are in 2023, 61 years later on September the 12th, announcing the launch pad. And so that was a deadline which uh, everybody was able to meet. There was, it was standing room only when we launched that, actually, in a big room. And since then, we spent the last six months putting this together. And we've got some exciting projects coming through um, everywhere from uh, treating uh, lung diseases to treating um, things like diabetic foot ulcer. Uh, we have really interesting, cool technologies coming out of the labs in Houston uh, that could enable us to revolutionize biological manufacturing or protein manufacturing, where you actually have a little factory inside each patient now. Yep. Yes. Um, so this is really sort of uh, big picture stuff, big thinking stuff. But it's matched now by the Texan spirit. So where I'm sitting today is in the middle of a $5.6 billion investment that Texas Medical Center through Bill McKeon actually set up. And um, Bill is actually on our advisory panel for the uh, launch pad. But it's a magnificent facility. There are going to be uh, many companies in here that can work in this uh, infrastructure we have side by side with clinicians from MD Anderson, Baylor, mm -hmm. Methodist, and places, places, places like that. But um, what's really important about it is that this is just the beginning, okay? Yes. Um, so we're able to leverage this infrastructure. Houston is a great place to live and work. I'm actually thinking of buying a place here myself now. Nice. And it's got all the science we need. It's got the infrastructure we need. In terms of a complex therapy like cell and gene therapy, you can do anything from lab scale work to development work to scale up work to manufacturing all in the same area and it's also connected very well through two different airports that uh, can take your products anywhere you like mm. in the world so it's got everything you need to be successful and um, what we're trying to do down here is help everyone join the dots and integrate what we do at rice with what we do here at the texas medical center as well and the ultimate goal here is just to get things to patients faster Right. that's simple no you've been uh, it, it's an amazing uh schedule you've been on there i mean you've been on a tear um as you mentioned some of the uh, you know i took a time to look through you know several of these programs each one's <laughs> more fascinating than the next i know we won't have a lot of time to go into to each of them but um i thought we could touch on a few of me and sure. uh, obviously, the one that you know has been in the press lately uh, is the, uh, the the Thor project, um, you know, funded by ARPA H to the tune of forty five million dollars. Uh, you know, what Paul was just talking about, so the integration of drug delivery vehicle, uh, biomaterial, all in one, sort of this, you know, uh, hey, we don't have to hook patients up anymore at the beds and IV bags, but you know, every person will have a little uh, sort of system inside them. Could you? To the extent you could talk about, you know, uh, what's going on, we, you know, we've been profiling the RPH gang on the other side from the program managers, but love to hear the little story on this one. Yeah. So, again, this kind of originated from uh, working closely with the clinicians at MD Anderson, in particular, Amir Jazeera, who's a gynecological oncologist and treats a lot of patients with ovarian cancer. And ovarian cancer is unfortunately a disease which has a particularly difficult prognosis uh, you know, most patients are diagnosed late stage, and at the time they're diagnosed, uh, uh, the current treatments recurrence is quite high, and so it's about a 50% survival outcome, unfortunately, and in cases where there's recurrence, it's uh, almost always fatal. And so um, talking to him closely, he had um, for years been collecting data from uh, patient samples. These were patients prior to treatment with carboplatinum versus after treatment. And uh, also has been doing a lot of work with intraperitoneal delivery of immunotherapies. And he had this uh, really awesome data that had been curated over the course of probably decades of him and his colleagues really thinking deeply about this problem. And it was clear that, you know, what happens in these patients is as you treat them with standard of care, you create a super immunosuppressed environment, allowing the tumor to thrive. And this has made these kind of cancers particularly non-responsive to uh, immunotherapies like checkpoint therapies. And uh, when we looked at the deep profiling of the data, 
certain cytokines really stood out as molecules that were totally not there. I mean, they were downregulated to uh, incredibly low levels, probably because the, the immune cells that produce them were missing. Um, and we have this hypothesis that, you know, if you can restore the repertoire of the right immune populations, uh, in particular through cytokine and antibody therapies, which are intended to boost and activate particular immune cells, uh, these are effector T cells and whatnot, then you could make these patients that are not responsive to checkpoint therapy responsive now. But this is difficult to do because cytokines are tough to control. Their dosing, it has to be fine-tuned, and we needed to build an adaptive system. And an adaptive system is one where it can measure what the status is in that patient and really provide the right cytokine concentrations. Now, when we thought about this at first, we were like, well, this is tough to do. But I have a network of engineers that I work with, both at Rice as well as across the, the country. I have great close collaborators at Northwestern, Carnegie Mellon, Georgia Tech. And I thought about all the elements that are needed to build such a device. And I found expertise that actually when you when you looked at it, the tech, core technologies had been built, but for different purposes. Like we have glucose sensors that are implantable yep. and they're quantifying concentrations of glucose. So it became practical to think we could repurpose that for quantifying concentrations of cytokines. We have wireless communication with pumps. And the way those pumps work is through, uh, you know, Bluetooth technology. And so I, I spoke with colleagues at Georgia Tech and they were like, yeah, we could repurpose the same thing to activate cells. You know, my lab is really interested in deep into synthetic biology, engineering regulation into cells, leveraging cells for biologic production. And so then it became quite apparent that the pieces to build such a device where you could monitor and produce the immunotherapies in the patient is possible. No one has done it. There's a lot of risk in doing it. If we approached the VC or the NIH and said, hey, we want to build this, probably they wouldn't fund it. But the ARPA-H mechanism, what's brilliant about it is yeah. they're visionary and they can see the potential for such a solution to be super impactful, not just for ovarian cancer, but a broad range of cancers and a broad range of immune dysregulatory problems, which cancer is one of. It is a failure of the immune system. Yeah. So restoring that could really uh, be the solution to the cure. Now, um, this device, what's great about ARPA-H is we're six months in. We've already made a lot of progress. We have prototypes that we've built. And with the ARPA-H funding, we can go all the way from concept to first in man clinical trial. Yeah. And um, doing so with the manner we thought about, and some of this came because we were working with ARPA-H and, and speaking with them about what we know what would work, but also how to make this scalable so that many patients can benefit from it. You know, healthcare is becoming a lot more consolidated. We have, we're sitting in a very large medical center, which is fantastic if you live in Houston. But if you don't, getting treatment is quite burdensome. Usually you have to leave your rural area, travel to a place like Houston. You have to stay here for maybe the four to six months that you get therapy. And having that room, ability to have an implantable device that is then wirelessly monitored really opens up the possibility to make these kind of solutions much more accessible, uh, even in the during during the trial stage. And of course, the impact that it would have once it's approved. Yeah. So that's where we are with the project and where what the vision is behind it. And, and while we're on that theme, and, and Paul, I'll, I'll get to you in a minute, but I just want to touch on one other thing while uh, we're, we're on uh that topic of meat and um you know because another guest i had a few months ago was commander cretian from darpa bto talking about the the sort of the golden hour triage program going on and, and thinking about you know can we send that signal to the war zone to help repair somebody and all that you also got this darpa repair program regenerative electronic platform through advanced intelligent regulation same you know, type of concept, uh, but here we're talking about external wound healing, sensors, yeah. electric stimulators, healing factors. Say a few words if you would. Another really cool project. Yeah, so, so, so that project, uh, again, was, uh, uh, you know, DARPA had this call, which was we're looking for approaches that can accelerate wound healing yep. uh, by 50%. And that was the requirement. And um, 
we thought about a number of ways one could do it. And again, talking to clinicians, um, understanding deeply, like, why is it that wounds don't heal? Why is it when they get beyond a certain size? I mean, it's really fascinating. You know, if you get a small cut, it heals on its own. But if it's a really big cut, you have to get a stitch. Mm -hmm. And how is it that the immune cells know what the size of cut it is? What is preventing them from healing it? And why does the stitch help that? It turns out that uh, the a wound is got spatial and temporal regulation to it. Yep. And um, part of that is a defense mechanism where if you get a big cut, your body naturally knows the safest thing to do is to go into scarring mode. And once it goes into scarring mode, it doesn't heal anymore. The goal becomes to, you know, seal it as quickly as possible to prevent infection. But in the context of wound healing, this could be quite detrimental because it leads to scar tissue formation. And we thought about we need technologies to fool the immune system within the wound environment to think of a very large wound as a series of small wounds. So the patch idea and the ability to leverage these bioelectronic sensors combined with actuators to activate production of molecules is really how we thought about doing it, but we didn't know which combination would work. And so the beauty of that project has been, we can test so many combinations, look at the wound healing state. And um, in the context of a trial, the whole integrative adaptive system, you can actually iterate uh, across many patients and leverage the data to even come up with better healing kind of programs. Yeah. And uh, as the more and more you use it, the better it becomes. And that's sort of the idea behind the store project too. As you start healing patients, as you start curing their cancer, you'll get a sense as to, well, if I see this phenotype, what should the response be? And that I think is the interface where of um, AI data, having actuators like bioelectronics and being able to modulate those. I think that is the future of medicine. And that's why we're investing heavily in these areas because mm -hmm. it allows you to do things that are not possible today. Yep, mm -hmm. absolutely. Paul, um, uh, you know, Omid is generating, you know, and probably will generate, you know, <laughs> hundreds of, of, of these technologies that spin into these programs. Uh, but did you have this other responsibility to incubate new companies. And so, you know, uh, Avenge Bio was in the incubator. You got the, this really cool shop called Motif Neurotech doing some uh, neurotech implants. Uh, what's your strategy for that area? Because obviously you got this amazing science and technology, but you don't want to see these companies fly the coop and head off to wherever. Uh, you want to keep them in Houston. You want to grow the uh, Houston biotech economy. Uh, talk a little bit about what's happening there. That's um, actually a good question. So the uh, the first thing I would just um, uh, comment on is that what I'm here to do is to help these people form companies and build them the right way. Yep. And where you actually have the market assessment go side by side with technological development. And there's a process to doing that. So you actually make sure you develop a product that the patient needs and the market wants, right? Um, and that's a discipline that we're implementing from day one. It always involves a clinician as being part of that decision on how we develop a product. And uh, there's um, a way about um, making sure that you put a plan in place, things like that, that we're going to bring to the launch pad. And our idea is to bring a corporate team that's been used to doing that type of thing to the launch pad that can leverage all of those skill sets across multiple companies. So it'd be a cost-effective way for people to start companies. The um, the other thing that we're going to be doing is providing uh, companies that start out in the launch pad with uh, class A lab space. It's actually two floors above us here. And um, that will be uh, a replicate of Omid's lab effectively. So they'll be able to work there for the first two years rent-free um, on the technology. They don't have to worry about where they're going to get a finance person to help them with the accounts. We'll take care of that, for example. We'll take care of things like um, legal agreements. We're also going to be taking care of things like business development transactions, uh, both within the spin-out companies we create, but also within the launch pad, because we do have um, people that uh, uh, are interested in licensing these technologies from Rice, um, inventors like Omid. But it's actually going to be 
a great way to uh, make the launch pad more efficient by doing both at the same time, creating companies and doing licensing. But ultimately, what we're here to do is create jobs. Um, yep. And we're going to create jobs by treating patients properly. So uh, what I hope for is for us to be able to grow um, lots of new companies out of Rice. Uh, Motif is a good example. We have a benefit at Rice, which um, you were just talking about. They have received numerous large awards in the past five years, totaling over $200 million that have enabled them to de-risk these technology platforms and get them into the clinic. Yep. And so our intent is to use that funding to be able to take products into the clinic and then raise serious venture capital around those when they're ready to go into the clinic. So usually at the pre iron just before the IND phase of a, a drug development process, for example. And um, what we'd like to do is to make sure that we keep them down here. So all of the companies are going to benefit from the low operational costs that exist in Texas. So if you compare the cost of running a company down here in Texas compared to what it is in Kendall Square, Cambridge, the rental costs alone are less than half of what you see in Cambridge. Nice. And that's money that's just wasted. You can't spend it on R&D. Right. Uh, what they've been able to do down here in Houston as well is integrate all of the research and development um, that we're seeing here in uh, the Texas Medical Center Helix Park with um, people literally across the street that have practicing clinicians in world-class institutions like MD Anderson. So we're going to bring much more efficiency, but also I think um, a better quality of uh, research projects to the market mm -hmm. as well. So that's what we're trying to build here. And um, I'm hoping that within about, it's going to be a long-term project, but within a decade, I'm hoping that we'll see numerous companies here based in Houston, creating a lot of jobs in Houston. The, uh, the number of graduates in this uh, area that, come out of these schools in the sort of space we're into which is bioengineering and biotechnology in general is substantial mm -hmm. and um, so the we are passionate about making sure we can create job opportunities for those people locally uh, instead of them leaving houston and going to work in places like boston or san francisco yeah absolutely and uh, you know, while we're on this theme, uh, Omid, I, I noticed that uh, in a couple of weeks you're going to be um, at the the Texas Healthcare Bioscience Institute Life Science Summit. You're going to be on this panel entitled "Surviving the Valley of Death," um, and, and we talked a little bit about uh, very unique ways, you know, like the ARPA and DARPA funding, which you know maybe wasn't there ten years ago, and so you know, I, obviously new invest in, investment mechanisms to. Uh, you know, pre prevent against that valley of death. We, we've talked about companies and technologies. Talk a little bit, both of you, about sort of the, the bioinvestment ecosystem that's developing down there in Texas as well, because this is obviously a crucial sort of third leg to all of this um, that's going on, yeah. especially as these companies spin mm -hmm. out. So, um, you know, I think there's capital in Texas. Uh, there's a lot of affluent people. Uh, it's not very organized. But there is quite a lot of capital down here. There are a number of funds that are on the early stage side. Actually, the Texas Medical Center has their own investment fund that Bill McKeunen, uh leads. And uh, I think it's a $50 million fund. They invest in early stage ideas. They also, uh, th th there's talk about doubling that. Um, there's a few venture funds like KDT. There's also uh, Sante Ventures and... Um, I think what's interesting here is really the opportunity to organize a lot of the capital that currently gets assembled. And, you know, like when we talk to the big, big funds, they raise a lot of money down here for family offices. Right. But then not a lot of the money gets deployed back in Texas or Houston. And I think there's a big desire to do that. I think it takes someone to organize it. Uh, there's clearly a lot of opportunities. There's a lot of ideas. The executive talent is something that we're working on heavily to bring uh, down here uh, because that's critical. But I think, you know, uh, you also want your ideas to be competitive in any ecosystem. And so, you know, sometimes my colleagues say like, oh, there's not enough capital here. I'm like, well, we just need better ideas because if you have really good ideas and, <laughs> you know, if there's good opportunities, I don't think like where you live is, is necessarily a barrier uh, you, you know, we, we've successfully built companies in a number of different ecosystems. And I think part of that is 
really having something that is unique and has an unfair advantage over all other opportunities out there. And when investors see that, you know, they'll be supportive uh, if it's in the right areas that are are hot markets, you know. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's another part of it. Yeah. So I think the, the other thing we're working on as well, Iris, we, we've actually just come out of a three-hour meeting and tour of the uh, Helix Park with JP Morgan. So nice. We're actually getting um, big funds down here to uh, to see what we're doing. We had another one in yesterday. And um, what's actually surprised me is how little the outside world is familiar with what's going on down here in Houston at the moment. So part of it is a marketing um, skill that we're going to bring to the, to the table here to make more people aware of everything that's good at, at Houston about drug development. I mean, it's well known for the medical treatment down here. Places like MD Anderson are world famous. And, sure. um, you know, if you stay in a hotel down here, you'll see people from all over the world staying in hotels to receive treatment mm -hmm. in this this area. But um, it's not um, as broadly known, obviously, amongst the venture capital community as a biotech hub. And that's because until more recently, until the advent of this Helix Park, the um, in actual fact, Texas Medical Center had to change its charter. Bill McEwen actually pioneered that to allow them to have for-profit organizations on their campus. Mm. And so what he's done is he's used that now to create a fully integrated um, ecosystem down here that will support projects from, from the lab all the way through to the patient and um, you know they have they see more patients at this medical center than anywhere else in the world. There's no medical center bigger than this one, and it's about to double in size over the years to come. So, a lot of clinical trials can be run down here, almost exclusively down here. I'm sure, given the number of patients that they actually see. So, we're putting all that together. And um, whilst there's a lot of grant money here, and as Amid mentioned, a lot of family offices are investing in funds that do invest in biotech but unfortunately not a lot of it gets recycled down here in houston mm. and i think that's just an awareness issue as much as anything sure. else um sure. so what we're trying to do is reach out to these bigger funds and uh, begin to attract their attention to this particular opportunity down here i'm actually really excited about it. i don't think there's anything else i've seen in my lifetime that represents something as significant as what's happening down here in texas right now mm -hmm. Um, what's, uh, what's coming up, uh, the next couple of months for both of you that we should know about? Uh, I see that, Omid, you're going to be, I think, headed off to Paris in June for some really cool bioelectronics, uh, symposium, uh, that Reist is, uh, hosting over there. Uh, Paul, conferences, uh, talks you're going to be giving, uh, other public facing stuff where we could potentially run into you, meet you, listen to what's going on. Anything else that I missed while I have both of you, please. Well, I think actually I will be, I will be in Paris too because I couldn't oh, nice. opportunity to uh, <laughs> hang out with Omid again. Yeah, um, this is actually important because it's I think it's probably the world's first hybrid bioelectronics conference that's ever been organised. Awesome, and it's by invitation only. But um, we've had over overwhelming demand to attend, so uh, we're looking forward to it a lot. It's just before the Olympics, so hopefully the city's going to be quiet. But um, I think it's actually just a sign of where things are going in the future, where um, things like AI, electronics, manufacturing, and uh, synthetic biology, for example, all come together to create these small devices that can now be implanted into patients, but they're also intelligent devices. And uh, that's something that Omid and his team at Rice have been working very hard on in the past five or six years. And I think they've actually created a world-class capability to do that now, which um, I would say is probably the leading capability in the world today as we know it. Yeah, yeah it's it, it should be a great, great meeting in Paris, and uh, uh, we're we're looking forward to doing that uh, more frequently. This will be the first one, but uh, yeah. Real, really great stuff. I, uh, I'm gonna can 
I look forward to continue to watching the, the evolution of this because I'm I'm extremely excited just listening to both of you guys talking about it. And uh, uh, it's it's definitely a, a very promising future you're setting up down there. Um, again, for everybody that uh, is going to be uh, listening to this particular episode of our show across the various podcast networks or who will be watching on our YouTube channel. Again, you've been listening uh, to Dr. Paul Watton, uh, Rice Biotech Launchpad Executive Director, and Dr. Omid Vesa, Associate Professor, Department of Engineering, and Director of Biotech Launchpad at Rice. Um, gentlemen, I, I really want to thank you both for taking the time out of your schedules to, to talk to us for a little while about what you're up to. Um, thank you for what you do. And as we like to say on our show here, you know, thank you for creating a, a better tomorrow for so many patients out there via what you're doing. It's a, it's a really great story and I wish you the best with it. Thank you very much. Thank you for having us. Thanks.